We can hear that. Beruchim Havaim. Welcome everyone to this very special donor appreciation event featuring America's preeminent constitutional scholar, Erwin Shemarinsky, and our dear friend, Beth Crom, who served for 16 years as city council member and mayor of the city of Irvine. This is our first donor appreciation event. Those of you joining us are among those who help sustain and advance the creatively Jewish pro programming that we offer through the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County. You are our sustainers, and we are so grateful for your enduring support. Connection to community is always important and never more than in challenging times like these. The timing of this event is aptly called the court, the constitution, and the state of our democracy. And this makes the prospect of hearing Dean Shemarinsky in conversation with Beth Crom all the more compelling. With the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett expected to take place tomorrow and a presidential election just over one week away, not to mention that we're in the midst of a pandemic, we're all feeling a bit overwhelmed and apprehensive to say the least. As most of you know, Dean Shemarinsky who currently see, serves as the Dean of the law school at UC Berkeley, has strong connections to Orange County, having served as the founding Dean of UC Irvine's law school from 2008 to 2017. It's a credit to the leadership of Dean Shemarinsky that the national jurist named UC Irvine Law School one of the best schools for practical training in 2018 and ranked UC, UCI Law School number four overall with an A plus grade, one of only nine law schools to be one of only nine law schools to receive top honors. And that's not bad for the first law school opened in California in over 40 years. We're also very proud that those connections extend to our Jewish community in which Dean Chemerinsky and his family have, are actively involved. In fact, this is the second conversation with Dean Chemerinsky that former mayor Beth Crom has moderated, the first of which occurred hosted by Jewish Federation and Family Services in 2016 after that election. Author of a dozen books, more than 200 law school articles and numerous opinion pieces in major publications, Dean Shemarinsky has argued numerous cases before the Supreme Court and was one of several lawyers who brought a lawsuit against President Donald Trump for violating the emoluments clause of the Constitution. But above all else, Dean Shemarinsky is a mensch of the highest order, and it's such a great honor to have you with us today. So now this is the perfect time for me to turn this conversation over to my friend and teacher, Beth Crown. Thank you very much, Marcia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. 
Uh, and let me also welcome Dean Chemerinsky and echo how truly honored we all are to have you with us. Um, thank you truly for the gift of your presence today. In thank you for inviting me. And let me just say thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. I wish there was some way my mom could tune in to hear you say those things. I really appreciate it. We can send it well, to her. We're, we're very, we will. We'll send it to her. Um, in each question I'm going to pose to you, there will be an underlying question, which is this. In this time of intense political division with a president who plays by his own set of rules, serious questions about how those who hold the levers of power are using it, what hope can we have that our constitution can continue to guide and protect our democracy? And let me take a moment to let those watching know that you are free to put uh, questions in the chat, uh, which will come to us panelists, uh, and I'll be able to view them. I've structured my questions to cover the broad strokes around issues related to the court, the constitution and the state of our democracy, and hopefully we'll cover everything you ever wanted to know in an hour with, with, with Dean Chemerinsky. Um, and as mentioned, uh, the Dean and I have known each other for some time since he came to Irvine as the founding Dean of the UC Irvine Law School um, at a program I moderated uh, just after the 2016 election, which um, Rabbi Tilchin alluded to. Um, we were joined by the former Dean of Chapman University, John Eastman. And I, I recall how, how deeply affected uh, Dean Chemerinsky was by the outcome of that election and all that it might portend. And frankly, I remember being less than impressed with the somewhat gloating mood that John Eastman was in, in which he seemed not at all concerned about the implications of this um, change of leadership. So let me start out um, with uh, a question um, about whether things unfolded largely as you anticipated um, on that day in 2016 and whether history can offer anything hopeful for us to hang on to by way of perspective as we kind of brace ourselves for the outcome of the coming election, frankly, regardless of what side of the political spectrum one is on, we, we all know that um, there's uncertainty ahead. And so anything you can offer us by way of your uh, extraordinary knowledge of the Constitution and the history of the United States to help us feel a little less anxiety? That's so kind. Let me separate that into two parts. The first is how have things turned out compared to what I might have anticipated in 2016? I was worried after the election for what the Trump presidency would mean for the things that I believe in. And to be honest, the Trump presidency has been so much worse than anything I feared. Take the example of immigration. I never imagined in my lifetime that we would have an administration that would separate parents and children at the border. I never imagined we have a situation where we'd literally be locking up children, often holding them in what seems to be no better than cages. I never imagined that the president would try to rescind the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival program, one that protects over 800,000 dreamers. I picked one example. I didn't imagine the president would try to roll back so much in the way of environmental protection and deny the climate change, something we're seeing the effects of every day. And obviously, in my wildest nightmares, I couldn't have imagined something like the pandemic and the president making a pandemic a partisan issue rather than a public health issue. Now, what do I have to offer hope? And maybe talk to me after November 3rd and see, but you know, what gives me hope is the overall sweep of American history. That when you look at the course of American history, there's been such tremendous advances in equality and freedom. Yes, we have a huge way to go with regard to race. And I hope the reckoning with racism and anti-blackness will take us further than we've been before towards equality. But still compared to where this country was when it was founded or after the civil war, or even I was born in 1953, 
At that time, every state still had laws that segregate, every Southern state had laws that segregated every aspect of their lives. We think about where we've come with regard to equality of women. Again, there's a huge way to go, but that's just in your and my lifetime, but there have been great advances there. But take gay and lesbian rights. It's only five years ago that the Supreme Court said that gays and lesbians have a constitutional right to marry. So my answer to the latter part of your question is to quote the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Where he said, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. And so we may be in a point of regressiveness with regard to rights and equality now, but I believe over the course of history, it's gonna get much better. Well, you know, one of the things that I think we all thought would be, you know, a stopgap against the worst things happening is the separation of powers, which outlines a system of checks and balances that was designed presumably to hold each branch of government accountable and pre prevent a majority from ruling with an iron fist. And then there's the First Amendment, which provides for separation of church and state, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. But here we are with a president whose power is not being checked by a Senate majority, which seems to have abdicated its fundamental obligation, leaving Congress powerless to exercise its own influence. And the political litmus test for the Supreme Court justices and what many would argue is an open assault on facts, science, and the press. And you have an environment in which the very thing the framers feared seems to be unfolding before our eyes. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this and how should we, the people, view our own role in both contributing to this and rectifying it. Um, and, and I guess also, has, have there been other times to compare this to when that system of checks and balances seemed broken as well, but somehow repaired itself? You're right that the system of checks and balances hasn't worked in recent years like it's supposed to. Because of the impasse in Congress, I think that President Obama did things by executive order that should have been done by statute. And we've certainly seen President Trump try to do things by executive order that should be done by statute. But I've learned something over the last several years, how much the Constitution assumes the good faith of those who govern us. And if there's not that good faith, there's often no remedy. Let me give you examples. In 2016, Justice Antonin Scalia died in February. In March, President Obama named Chief Judge Merrick Garland to replace him. The Senate then said, no hearings, no vote. Senate Leader Mitch McConnell said, in an election year, it should be for the people to decide who's gonna fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. The good faith we'd assume of the Senate wasn't there. So when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on September 18th, I assume the Republicans would say, let's let whoever's elected president on November 3rd fill the vacancy. But less than an hour after Justice Ginsburg's death was announced, Senate Majority Leader McConnell said, we're gonna rush somebody through. And Amy Coney Barrett's gonna be firm tomorrow, October 26th, less, just a little bit more than a month after Justice Ginsburg's death. That's not good faith. Well, I'll give you another example. The constitution makes it clear that Congress has the power of the purse. Any spending of federal money has to be approved by Congress. The Supreme Court has said that on so many occasions. President Trump wanted Congress to fund the border wall. Congress refused. At this time, there's a Republican majority in the House and a Republican majority in the Senate. And in December and January, 2018 and 2019, the federal government shut down because of this impasse over funding the border wall. The federal government was closed for 35 days, the longest shutdown in American history. President Trump capitulated and said that he would sign a budget without the money he wanted for the border wall. But what did he do? He went ahead and spent the money anyway out of Defense Department funds. The law is clear he doesn't have the power to do that. And yet nothing has happened. A uh, uh, court has said he can't and the Supreme Court last week granted a review. To me, these are the examples of how the constitution assumes that those who govern will act in good faith and they haven't. 
This isn't the only constitutional crisis this country has faced. After all, we had a civil war, we had reconstruction, we went through the constitutional impasse of the 1930s where the Supreme Court was striking down President Roosevelt's New Deal legislation. We've come through those crises. We have to hope we're gonna come through this one as well. Has there been a, an occasion when a president, you know, the checks and balances failed and a president did not act in good faith and there was accountability for either the legislative branch, the executive branch, or, you know, I mean, you know, has, has the Supreme Court played that role historically of being the strongest leg on that three-legged stool? Sometimes. I'd go back to 1974, the Supreme Court's decision in the United States versus Nixon. This was an instance where President Nixon refused to provide tapes of White House conversations. They were wanted as part of evidence to be used in a criminal prosecution of those involved in the Watergate cover-up. And the Supreme Court unanimously, it was eight to nothing, ruled against President Nixon, ordered him to produce the tapes. When they were released, they revealed criminal activity on the part of President Nixon. And within days, he resigned from office. That was our system of checks and balances working. And here, the ultimate check is gonna be what happens on November 3rd. It's really up to the people to evaluate whether or not President Trump has been true to the constitution or whether we need a change if somebody's in office. You know, you brought up Ruth Bader Ginsburg who did pass away just a little over a month ago. And of course, we in the Jewish community feel a particularly strong connection to her as the first um, Jewish woman appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, as I had mentioned to you, uh, I feel a personal connection because she attended James Madison High School in Brooklyn with my mother in the same class. They did not know each other, but they, they were in that same graduating class. So uh, one of those six degrees of separation things. Um, on the surface, it would appear that the only things that Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and soon to be appointed Justice uh, Amy Coney Barrett have in common is that they are uh, both women and they both have three names. So, um, <laughs> Can you contrast the two from a more judicial perspective and tell us how you anticipate the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court may affect rulings on some very important issues we anticipate may be coming before the court, regardless of the outcome of the election? I think you got it exactly right. What they share in common is they're female and they both took their husband's name as a last name and made their name a middle name. She was Amy Coney and Mary Barrett and um, Ruth Bader, Mary and Marty Ginsburg, that's it. Um, it. They couldn't be further apart on the political spectrum. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an outspoken liberal. Amy Coney Barrett is as conservative as any federal judge in the United States. That's why Donald Trump picked her. Where might this matter? Abortion rights. There are now five votes on the Supreme Court to overrule Roe versus Wade. I have zero doubt that the Supreme Court in the next couple of years is going to overrule Roe. I always felt prior to September 18th that there were four justices who wanted to overrule Roe, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. I didn't think Chief Justice Roberts would be the fifth vote to overrule Roe, though I thought he'd be a vote to, to uphold many of the laws that restricted abortion rights. Everything we know about Amy Coney Barrett is she's going to vote to overrule Roe. She signed statements as a law professor that Roe was wrong and that it led to the killing of innocent children, unborn fetuses. And that, um, as a judge on the Federal Court of Appeals, she voted in favor of restrictions on abortion rights. And besides, she said repeatedly at the confirmation hearings that Justice Scalia's judicial philosophy is her judicial philosophy. And no justice in history has been more critical of Roe versus Wade than Antonin Scalia. What's this gonna mean? Abortion will remain legal in places like California and New York. 21 states already have laws on the books that prohibit all abortions. Several other states will adopt such laws. Women who have money in those states will be able to travel to New York or California if they need an abortion. 
before New York became the first state in this country to legalize abortion, 25% of the abortions in England were performed on American women. It wasn't poor women traveling to England for abortions. But poor women in the states where abortion is outlawed, teenagers in those states will again face the cruel choice to an unwanted pregnancy and a cheap, unsafe back alley abortion. Another example is lesbian, gay, transgender rights. The Supreme Court in 2015, as I mentioned, said that state laws that prohibited same-sex marriage were unconstitutional. That was 5-4, Justice Kennedy wrote, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Senator and Kagan. Kennedy and Ginsburg are gone from the court. Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas and Alito dissented. Justice Gorsuch wrote an opinion in 2017 we left no doubt that he thought that case was wrong and we vote to overrule it. And Amy Coney Barrett in 2015 said she thought it was wrong. I think there could be five votes to overrule that decision. With the very least, there's gonna be five votes to allow people, if they have religious objections to gay, lesbian, transgender individuals, to discriminate against them in employment or to refuse to provide service to same-sex couples. One more example, Beth, the Affordable Care Act. 21 million people in this country are receiving health care because the Affordable Care Act. In 2012, the Supreme Court five to four voted to uphold the Affordable Care Act. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, joined by Ginsburg, Breyerson, and Kagan. Well, there's another case about the Affordable Care Act that's gonna be argued in the Supreme Court in two weeks and Amy Coney Barrett will be there. In 2012, as a law professor at Notre Dame, she was very sharply critical of the Supreme Court's decision and Chief Justice Roberts' opinion. There well could be five votes now to declare the Affordable Care Act entirely unconstitutional and leave those 21 million people without health insurance in the midst of a pandemic. When you, um, because she, she made, on several occasions, the point of saying, you know, I, I hope you're not ch challenging my judicial independence. You know, I hope you're not questioning my capacity to be independent as a Supreme Court justice, regardless of who appointed me or what their expectations might be. When you, knowing what you know and having observed the court and, you know, and Congress for, uh, you know, and the Senate and these kinds of hearings, when you hear that, is there any part of you that thinks, you know, maybe despite her, her history, despite her record, maybe she will see an opportunity to distinguish herself from the pack? No. I see a 0% chance that she's going to be anything other than a very conservative justice. She was a very conservative law professor at Notre Dame. You pick the issues that divide liberals and conservatives like abortion rights, gun rights and the like. She was at the far right end of the political spectrum. That's why President Trump picked her for the Federal Court of Appeals. She was on that court for a couple of years. Without exception, she was taking the conservative position on every issue that was ideologically defined. She said very little to the senators week before last of the confirmation hearings, but she said repeatedly that Antonin Scalia's judicial philosophy is her judicial philosophy. That's the justice she clerked for on the Supreme Court. There's no hope, I think, that she's gonna somehow all of a sudden, having been a far right conservative her whole career, transform into a moderate or a liberal justice. It just doesn't happen. Donald Trump picked her because that was the nomination that would most please his conservative base. For those who are listening, if you're politically conservative, you now have the court you've always dreamed of. But if you're politically liberal, it's very frightening that it's gonna be a conservative court, not just for a short time, but a long time to come. I'll give you one statistic, Beth. Amy Coney Barrett is 48 years old. If she remains on the Supreme Court until she's 87, that's the age which Justice Ginsburg died, Justice Barrett will be a justice until the year 2059. Wow. I'll be 101 at that time. So 
Um, let me do a, a follow up. This is uh, actually a question that was asked by uh, Dr. Scott Spitzer, Rabbi Tilchin's husband. Um, I, I believe that there may have been some rules, some Senate Judiciary Committee rules that weren't weren't followed. Maybe it was practice more than rules in the Amy Coney Barrett nomination. Um, and A, do you believe that there were any actual rules that were not uh, followed? And if so, is there any basis for removing someone from the court if their confirmation was based on um, an illegitimate process? And is there any precedent for that? There were some Senate Judiciary Committee rules that weren't followed. I'll give you an example. The Senate Judiciary Committee says in order to have a quorum, they have to be two members of the minority party present. When they voted on Thursday to confirm, none of the Democrats attended the hearing. That rule wasn't followed, but they had the Republicans unanimously vote her to the Senate. And tomorrow, the Senate will approve her for the Supreme Court. But no. The fact that the rule isn't followed in Congress doesn't provide a basis for removing her from the Supreme Court. So long as tomorrow she gets at least 50 votes and the vice president's vote, if there's a tie, she'll be a Supreme Court justice for the rest of her life. And at this point, I know of only one Republican Senator, Susan Collins has said, not gonna vote for her. So I expect there'll be 53 votes for Amy Coney Barrett tomorrow. Won't need Mike Pence to break the tie. So Amy Coney Barrett will have a seat on the Supreme Court for as long as she lives. Well, it'll be interesting to see what Susan Collins does now that the one other person, um, and you know, it was interesting logic that Murkowski presented in her remarks. Um, there's been some talk, if should Biden win, should the Senate uh, shift to a Democratic majority about packing the court? Um, given the role of the Federalist Society and in influencing who gets considered for judicial appointments. And I think that goes back as far as at George H.W. Bush, that they've had influence. And if you want to say anything, not everybody understands the history of the Federalist Society and, and, and how they got this influence. But, um, but, but do you think that there is likely to be an effort and in any way a successful effort to pack the court and or to consider term limits for um, Supreme Court justices? Let me separate that into three parts. The first part goes to, is it likely the Democrats might try to increase the size of the Supreme Court? I'll start with a story. On Saturday, September 12th of this year, I participated in a conference at William & Mary Law School on the Supreme Court. In fact, Amy Coney Barrett was one of the participants in that conference, though not on this panel. And the moderator, Bob Barnes, who covers the Supreme Court for the Washington Post, asked us, did we think there was any chance there'd be an increase in the size of the Supreme Court? And I spoke up and I said, if God forbid something should happen to Justice Ginsburg between now and the election, and if the Republicans were to push through a very conservative individual, I think there's a real chance the Democrats will try to increase the size of the Supreme Court. Six days later, Justice Ginsburg died. And now on October 26th, tomorrow, the Senate is gonna confirm a very conservative justice to replace her. I think the Democrats need to seriously think about increasing the size of the Supreme Court. The number of justices is not set by the constitution. It's set by a federal law. It's varied between five and 10 over the course of American history. Nine is a historic accident. In the late 1860s, Congress didn't want a terribly unpopular president, Andrew Johnson, to fill a seat. So they said, the next time there's a vacancy, we'll eliminate the seat. And it's been nine ever since. I think what the Democrats need to say is, it's the Republicans who packed the court. The Republicans packed the court by blocking Merrick Garland and rushing through Amy Coney Barrett. And what the Democrats are looking to do is to restore balance. The danger of this for the Democrats is that if they make it 13, then when there's a Republican president, a Republican Congress, they could make it 15 or 17. And yet I think what the Democrats have to think very hard about is if they don't do this, what can they do about the Supreme Court? Can they accept a Supreme Court that's gonna be so conservative, not just for years, but a decade or two or more to come? 
Gral, I told you Barrett's age. Gorsuch is 52. Kavanaugh is 54. Roberts is 65. Alito is 70. Clarence Thomas is 73. John Paul Stevens stayed on the court until he was 90. We could have these six justices for a decade or two more. Second, term limits. I favor 18-year non-renewable terms for Supreme Court justices. I've argued this for years. Thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer now than it was in 1787. Then the average life expectancy was 36 years old. Clarence Thomas was 43 when he was confirmed for the court in 1991. If he remains until he's 90, he'll be a justice for 47 years. I don't want this to sound partisan. Elena Kagan was 50 when she was confirmed. If she stays till she's 90, that's 40 years as Supreme Court justice. That's too much power in one person's hands for too long a period of time. Also, too much now depends on the accident of history as to when a vacancy occurs. Richard Nixon had four vacancies in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter had no picks for the Supreme Court in his four years as president. Barack Obama got two nominations in eight years. Donald Trump has gotten three in less than four years. Here's a statistic. Since 1960, we've had 32 years with Republican presidents and 28 years with Democratic presidents. That's almost even. But Republicans have picked 15 Supreme Court justices and Democrats have picked eight. That's simply the accident when vacancies occurred. 18 year non-renewable terms would mean a vacancy every two years. Every president would get the same influence. But I think this would take a constitutional amendment. And I don't know that there's a constituency that cares enough to do the work to make it happen. And besides, every proposal for term limits would not apply to the justices currently on the Supreme Court. Final part of your question, the Federalist Society. It's a very conservative organization that is incredibly well-funded, including by the Koch brothers. And it has played an enormously important role in picking conservatives for federal court judgeships, including the Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, so, so now that we've kind of talked about the composition of the Supreme Court and the likely direction of the Supreme Court, you know, we do have an election in nine days. There are people who believe there's an effort underway to basically steal the election and disenfranchise voters, um, creating mistrust in the system by making baseless claims that the election is at risk of fraud on a grand scale, cutting funding to the Postal Service at a time of unprecedented mail-in voting um, in large measure because of the pandemic, um, to, um, you know, encouraging um, people to go to the polls as observers, you know, uh, intimidating uh, voters and something which I think actually is illegal in 50 states. In fact, I was interested, I found it interesting that um, I think that wearing a Make America Great hat is going to be an acceptable thing to take to the polling places, even though there are prohibitions on you know, on, you can't even bring campaign literature in. And apparently they don't think that gives away who you're planning to vote for. Um, but, um, and, and banking on a provision that allows Congress to ultimately settle the election with each state casting one vote, and Trump has talked about this, which would favor Republican states if the legislatures went along with it and chose to override the popular vote in their state and, and just give their instructions for their elect uh, their Congress, their their vote to go to um, the president, let's just say, hypothetically. So what are your thoughts? And do you believe the president has overstepped the bounds of his authority to try and game this election? I'm worried. To me, the solution is if a candidate wins by a large enough margin that the election's not in doubt, will then be able to preserve the legitimacy of the election and the next president. If Biden can win by a large enough margin that no one can say fraud accounted for what happened, or if Trump wins by a large enough margin that no one can say it was voter intimidation, then I think we solved the problem. But I look around the country, we're in the midst of a pandemic. 
And yet the strategy of the Republicans do everything they can to make it harder for people to cast absentee ballots. I worry about how there is a provision in the constitution that says that a legislature could declare it's gonna choose the electors from that state and not follow the popular vote. Might a state with a Republican legislature ignore who wins the popular vote and say, too much fraud, we're gonna give our electors to Donald Trump and what happens then? I'm worried too that the president has been repeatedly asked as his press secretary, will he honor the results of the election? And he said, he's refused to commit that he'll leave office if he loses. The attorney general has said they will follow the results only if they're quote, and I am quoting William Barr, only if the results are clear. All of this and so much more as we're talking on October 25th causes me great worry. And the only answer I can think of is to hope that the outcome is so clear. It doesn't come down to litigation, doesn't come down to state legislatures, doesn't come to Congress, that the people will choose the next president of the United States. Well, you know, um, you referenced the Electoral College um, and how they vote, the 270 electoral votes. Um, and um, I guess there have been five presidents uh, in the history of our country who have won thanks to the Electoral College, uh, even though they didn't get the popular vote. And, um, you know, two of those have been in the last 20 years. So um, we made it, I don't know, 250 years without really having a problem. And then it's gotten a little worse of late. Um, many people would like to do away with the Electoral College. And can you offer perspective on why we have the Electoral College, how electors are selected, and how the winner takes all rule can, can kind of override the will of the people? Sure. There was great debate at the Constitutional Convention over how to choose the president of the United States. Some thought it just be popular election. Some thought Congress should choose the president, like in a parliamentary system. Some thought that it should be the governors of the states who chose the president of the United States. And then a suggestion was raised of the Electoral College. Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers said that it's because we need to have the elites who we can trust choose the president. The Electoral College was really based on a distrust of democracy in the people. Also, the Electoral College was created to help the states that had slaves. It's a bit complicated, but remember, slaves couldn't vote. So if it was popular election of the president, the Southern states with slaves would not get any benefit from that population in choosing the president. The electoral college says that each state's electors is the sum of its senators and representatives. And the constitution said, that slaves would count as three fifths of a person in allocating representatives to the slave states. So slaves got a benefit in choosing the president from their slave population. This isn't hindsight. Hugh Williamson, a delegate to the Constitution Convention from North Carolina, James Madison, a delegate to the Constitution Convention from Virginia, both said that an advantage of the Electoral College was allowing the Southern states to get a benefit from their slave population. We shouldn't ignore that history. No other country in the world that calls itself a democracy can choose as its chief executive, the person who loses the popular vote. And you're right, Beth, it's happened five times in American history, twice in the last 20 years, in 2000 and 2016. All of the states except for Maine and Nebraska follow winner take all. So whoever wins the popular vote in California, by however the narrow the margin, gets 100% of the electoral votes from California. If you vote Republican in California for president, it's if you don't vote at all. If you vote Democratic for president and say Mississippi, it's if you don't vote at all, because all the electors in California are surely gonna go to Biden and all the electors in Mississippi are surely gonna go to Trump. I think the Electoral College should be eliminated. I strongly favor popular election of the president, but the problem is that would take a constitutional amendment. In Southern states, I'm sorry, small states benefit tremendously from the Electoral College. Um, 
Wyoming is the smallest state in population. California is the most populous. Someone in Wyoming gets, in essence, three votes for president compared to a vote cast by somebody in California. Wyoming's not going to vote to eliminate the Electoral College. It would take three quarters of the states to amend the Constitution to eliminate the Electoral College, and we'll never get to those three quarters of the states. Interesting. Um, not, not, you know, I mean, and, and I, I think this, if, if there's any good that's kind of come out of the last four years, I think it's caused all of us to want to polish up on our, our civics and, and on our history, because, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of things we would do with, if we had a crystal ball or a magic wand, but, you know, Unfortunately, we have to follow the system. It seems like some people have special privileges, but in order to get something like that done, um, it's helpful to understand that. Now, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about diversity on the Supreme Court, because I think uh, with um, Amy Coney Barrett, we will have seven, seven Catholics and one Episcopalian who used to be a Catholic and, and one Jew, <laughs> I think is... <laughs> Two Jews. Meyer and Kagan are Jewish. Oh, right, and two Jews. Okay, so, um, so, so, but, 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 looking at the court, you know, sort of, there have been 113 Supreme Court justices, uh, I believe, who've served since the first court convened in 1790. 107 have been white men. They seem to have a real advantage here. There have been a total of four women, eight Jews two black men, one Latina woman. Nine appointees had no prior judicial experience, including some of our most influential, John Marshall, William Rehnquist, Lewis Powell Jr., Abe Fortas, Earl Warren, William O. Douglas, Felix Frankfurter, Louis Brandeis, and Elena Kagan. Half of those people are Jews, so I'm proud of that. Always proud of my community. <laughs> and um, so is diversity relevant? to the work on the Supreme Court? Do you believe diversity of race, gender, life experience is relevant to how cases are considered? And in what ways do you think the composition of the current court will influence issues we now regard as settled law? And you've talked about a little bit of that. Oh, I think diversity on the court matters enormously. What's so crucial to realize is that the justices on the Supreme Court have tremendous discretion. What does cruel and unusual punishment mean? What's due process of law? Constitutional issues almost always involve balancing of competing interests. How things are balanced is very much a function of who's doing the balancing. There's a reason, say, that Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia almost always disagreed in important cases. They're both brilliant individuals. They both had great knowledge of the Constitution, but they had very different ideologies and worldviews. So the life experience of a justice, the ideology of a justice, matter enormously. Why did Mitch McConnell say on September 18th that the Republicans were going to confirm a replacement for Ginsburg before the election? Why did President Trump so quickly nominate somebody? Because we know that who's in that seat is going to matter. And there's everything in that seat is going to be there for decades. So who's on the court matters tremendously. And you know, ideologically, what we're going to have is five extremely conservative justices. We're going to have one moderate conservative justice. And then we're going to have three left of center justices, one of whom Sotomayor is very liberal. Um, that's the composition that we're going to have for some time to come. Now, you mentioned that we're going to have seven justices who either are now or were Catholic. Gorsuch was born Catholic, but now practiced Episcopalian. Let me be clear as I'm about to say this. No one should ever be picked on account of religion. No one should ever be opposed on account of religion. But we've got to ask the question, how do we end up with, in essence, seven Catholic justices? I think there's an easy answer to that. And that's the issue of abortion, how important abortion is to the Republican Party, how much Republican presidents have wanted to send a signal to their base that they're picking justices who will vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. And I think that it's not coincidence, given the population of the country, that we have such a disproportionate number of Catholics, because I think it's been a way for presidents to send a signal to the Republican base that they're picking justices who are going to vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes, and I've gotten some questions from 
uh, the audience. So um, I'm just going to take them in the order that I got them. Uh, from Scott Mentor, Israel in its proto-constitutional basic laws has adopted a right to quote human dignity. Do you feel that the United States Constitution somehow implicitly endorses that concept as well? And if not, should it? Yes, I believe the Supreme Court endorses it. And on many occasions, the Supreme Court has spoken of dignity as a basic value. When the Supreme Court said that gays and lesbians have the right to marry, Justice Kennedy talked about this in terms of the basic dignity of each individual. Or when the Supreme Court said that a state can't make it a crime for consenting adults to engage in same-sex sexual activity, the court spoke of the dignity of individuals is really elemental under the Constitution. I wish it were more clearly spelled out in the US Constitution, but I do think it's implicit in so many of the rights that are there. And um, this is from uh, Joseph Minsky. Article two of the Constitution states that the president executes the laws as promulgated by Congress. Doesn't that largely constrain the president's actions? I think you've touched on this, but maybe to answer it more directly. The simple answer is no. We have seen a great expansion, starting particularly with the Obama presidency, but far more with the Trump presidency, of using executive orders where statutes aren't possible. President Obama did this with the DACA and the DAPA programs, the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals and Deferred Action for Parents of Americans. He did it in the environmental area. President Trump has done this in so many areas that just on Thursday of this week, President Trump by executive order very much limited the Hatch Act, which is what says civil service workers can't engage in political activity. President Trump has tried to do things like extend unemployment benefits by executive order, rescind DACA by executive order, stop the census by executive order. Um, and I'm very troubled by this trend. I have a simple idea for separation of powers that I think is embodied in the constitution. And it's very elegant. The Constitution wants two branches of government to be involved in any major government action. To adopt the law requires the president and Congress be involved. To enforce the law requires the president and the judiciary. To put somebody on the Supreme Court or an ambassador, a cabinet official, takes the president and the Senate. To go to war takes the president and the Congress. And I think anything that has the president acting unilaterally is inconsistent with that notion of checks and balances. Thank you. Um, Sue and Rob Kaplan uh, had a couple questions. Does originalism as a legal theory have a legitimate intellectual and historical foundation? No, I'll give a quick answer, but should you want a longer answer, I had an op-ed in the New York Times online Wednesday, Thursday of this week, where I talked about why originalism is very much a false promise. Some of, let me define it first. Originalism is the idea that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed when it's adopted and we changed only by amendment. So the meaning of article two is the same as adopted in 1787. The meaning of the first amendment is the same as adopted in 1791. The meaning of the 14th amendment equal protection is the same as adopted in 1868. To start with, we can't know what was the original understanding at that time. There was tremendous disagreement over people like Hamilton and Madison. When I teach constitutional law, I'm always pointing to places where Hamilton and Madison just disagreed in terms of the meaning of a constitutional provision. So many people were involved in drafting and ratifying constitutional provisions. It's a myth to say there's an original understanding to be found. But besides that, originalism makes no sense it makes no sense that in 2020, we should be guided by the views of those who lived in 1787 or 1791. In fact, it would lead to quite repugnant results. I'll give two quick examples. Article two of the constitution refers to the president and the vice president with the pronouns he. There's no doubt that the original understanding was that the president and the vice president would be men. If we're originalists, it would be unconstitutional to elect a woman as president or vice president until the constitution was amended. Or another example. 
The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment also voted to segregate the District of Columbia Public Schools. If one was truly an originalist, one would have to say Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided. To me, that shows why originalism is unacceptable. In fact, I believe that the conservative justices ignore originalism when it doesn't get to the conservative results they want. Thank you. Um, Sue and Rob also were wondering um, if the Equal Rights Amendment could actually get rat ratified, I'm assuming, I don't know, with a change in the political winds. Well, I think a change in the political composition of Congress could be sufficient here. Three fourths of the states have now at some point ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Virginia having been the most recent to do so just in this year, 2020. There were a lot of legal issues. Five states that ratified have rescinded their ratification. The preamble to the ERA said it had to be ratified within seven years and that was extended three years. We're far beyond that. Ultimately, I believe under Supreme Court precedent, it's for Congress to decide whether an amendment is improperly ratified. And if the House and the Senate were to say in 2021 that the ERA is part of the Constitution because three quarters of the states have passed it, it would then be part of the Constitution. Okay, something hopeful to look forward to. Um, Chaya Beckerman wants to know um, whether we can have any hope that um, the Supreme Court will go the right way on the census question. I, I, I assume you will be able to interpret that. Sure. Yeah. Um, the Trump administration is calling a early end to the census counting. And so that's an issue being litigated. Also, and the Supreme Court's just granted a review in this question, we've traditionally under the census counted everybody, citizen, non-citizen, documented, undocumented, because the constitution says there's supposed to be an enumeration of the population. And in allocating seats in the House of Representatives, seats are allocated based on population. The Trump administration has said they don't wanna count undocumented individuals because then in allocating seats for the House of Representatives, undocumented individuals won't count. That will work to the disadvantage of states like California and New York and to the advantage of states that don't have an undocumented population. It will work to the disadvantage of blue states and to the advantage of red states. A three judge federal court declared that unconstitutional and the Supreme Court, as it's required to do, granted review. It's a case brought by the ACLU and it'll be argued in December, January, I think January of this coming year. Okay. Um, can the next, Rhea Doran was wondering, can a president reduce the size of the Supreme Court? No. First, anyone who's confirmed for a seat on the Supreme Court has that seat for life. So we could reduce the number of justices prospectively by saying the next time there's a vacancy, that seat will be eliminated. That's what Congress did in the 1860s but you can't take away a position from anybody who's there. And it can't be by the president. The number of seats on the Supreme Court is set by federal law. It would take Congress passing a bill and the president signing it or Congress adopting it over veto. And uh, Sharon Friedman, Friedman uh, is wondering if there's a lag in counting of the votes and weeks go by or even months, is it true that the Speaker of the House becomes the interim president? The constitution says that the president's term ends at noon on January 20th. In the unlikely event that no one is chosen as president or vice president by January 20th, but there is a speaker of the house, that person will become president. And it's not as interim president, it would become president of the United States because there wouldn't be a president or vice president. I think that's highly unlikely. I think that the greatest likelihood is that somebody's gonna get the majority in the electoral college. It takes 270 of the 538 votes. 
then somebody's going to get the majority. If there is a tie in the electoral college, and that seems unlikely with only two candidates running, then the election goes to the House of Representatives and each state gets one vote in the House and it'll be the new House, the House that's elected on November 3rd. We don't know the composition of the state delegations at that point. But in the unlikely event that we don't know who's the president or vice president, no one's chosen by January 20th, then it would look like Nancy Pelosi becomes president. But don't hold your breath. I don't think that's likely to happen. Okay. Um, do you see threats to Griswold versus Connecticut or Brown versus the Board of Education that those would be impacted? Directly, no. Indirectly, yes. No Southern state is gonna adopt a law that requires that black and white children attend separate schools, which would Brown versus Board of Education declared unconstitutional. I don't foresee any state adopting a law like the Connecticut one in Griswold versus Connecticut, which prohibited the sale, distribution, and use of contraceptives. But I do think we have a majority on the court now that believes that Griswold was wrongly decided and will allow states to regulate reproductive freedom, abortions, and even contraception in the ways in which the legislature wants. And I think we have a going to have a court that's not at all committed to racial equality and decisions with regard to race are going to come out against that value. So no, Griswold and Brown aren't likely to be overruled, but they don't need to be. But I think we have a court that's not at all committed to the underlying values of Griswold and Roe, privacy and equality. Okay, this last one falls more under Jew to Jew as opposed to constitutional scholar, but do you have any thoughts about why so many in the Jewish community think Trump is great because he unilaterally moved the embassy to Jerusalem? Uh, do you have any thoughts about this? And you know, predominantly as somebody who brings to your um, assessment of the executive branch, the constitution, the Supreme Court, also the 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 heart of a of a of a mensch as as uh, Rabbi Tilchin referred to you. Um, do you have any insight? And, and do you, does this kind of issue ever come up in the circles that you hang out in? Thanks again for the compliment, it's so sweet. Um, I'm so much more comfortable talking about constitutional law than <laughs> I am talking about, you know, which way does the Jewish community go in voting? Um, uh, let me try to be as neutral as I can. From 1948, until the Trump presidency, every president, Democratic and Republican, refused to take a position over who was sovereign over, is, over Jerusalem. President Trump was the first president to say, Israel is sovereign over Jerusalem and we're gonna move our embassy to there. It was an enormously controversial move. It was a symbolic move. Will that matter in terms of Jewish support for Trump? I don't know. It's interesting. There are two populations in the United States that remain solidly democratic, even as individual wealth increases, Jews and blacks. Most populations have historically become more Republican as they become more wealthy. That hasn't been true of Jews and it hasn't been true of blacks. Jews have voted over 80% democratic, blacks often as much as over 90% democratic. And it'll be interesting to see does Trump get a larger percentage of the Jewish vote on account of what he did with regard to the embassy? And I have seen a lot of polling, but I haven't seen any polling specifically with regard to what the Jewish community is likely to do on November 3rd. Well, with that, let's see. Um, oh, well, there were a couple late questions. Sure. Is, would you wanna be on the Supreme Court? Is that a dream that you have? Um, and do you think there's any chance in hell that you would ever be appointed to the Supreme Court? Well, the easy answer to that is I'm 67 years old and I'd be regarded as too old for a Supreme Court vacancy. Look okay. at the age of the justices who have been nominated. Barrett is 48, Gorsuch is 52, Kavanaugh is 54, Kagan was 50 when she was nominated. Um, and to be honest, I don't think a Democratic president should be picking a 67 year old man. They should be picking somebody who's gonna be there a longer amount of time. Um, 
Would I have wanted to be a Supreme Court justice? Of course. Have I spent any time in my career thinking about that? The honest answer is no. I've been so incredibly blessed in the jobs that I've had. I've never spent a minute thinking that I'm deprived because I don't get to be a Supreme Court justice. Um, being a Supreme Court justice is so much a matter of lightning striking. Look, if Donald Trump wasn't president, Amy Coney Barrett would be a pretty obscure conservative law professor at Notre Dame. Right. You know, um, it does um, make me want to ask one more question, which is, you have, you have met Supreme Court justices, you have argued before the Supreme Court. Um, you know, we all kind of see that as a, even whatever we feel about any of the justices personally, it's a very rarefied group of people. Um, what's it like to argue a case before the Supreme Court? And, and, and do you have any personal um, thoughts and experiences with any of the Supreme Court justices that are always going to stay with you? Um, um, I've argued seven times in the Supreme Court. It's always exciting. It's always intimidating. It's always frustrating. It's exciting because this is the chance to be part of shaping the law. The cases are there because they're gonna really make a difference in terms of people's lives, in terms of the legal system. It's intimidating because I don't wanna screw up. I don't wanna make a mistake and embarrass myself in front of the justices or in front of the reporters who cover the Supreme Court. And it's frustrating because the justices don't give you very much time to answer their questions before you get the next question. Um, I remember once getting a question from Justice Kennedy before I could answer, Justice Stevens said, add this to the hypothetical. Before I could answer, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, add this to the hypothetical. And um, I got one sentence out and Justice Scalia asked me a question about something totally different. Um, so it's it, it's just a, it's a, it's an exhilarating experience. Um, in terms of anecdotes with the justices, last October, Justice Ginsburg came and spoke at Berkeley Law School. She spoke in honor of a woman, Herma Hill Kay, who was the second woman law professor in the United States and had been dean at Berkeley Law School. Um, it was very close to Justice Ginsburg. And we created an annual lecture series, the, Herm Hill came Memorial Lecture and Justice Ginsburg came to give the inaugural lecture. And when she got out of the limousine, I went to the curb to meet her and she looked so frail. I first met her in 1986, so I've known her at least a little bit a long time. And then as soon as she began speaking, it was clear her voice was as vibrant as ever. Her mind was as sharp as ever. She was just frail. One uh, quick Ginsburg story. Um, in March, 2014, I wrote an op-ed in the LA Times saying Justice Ginsburg should retire this summer. I said, we have a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate. President Obama can have anyone he wants confirmed for the Supreme Court. It looks like the Republicans are gonna take the Senate in November, 2014. And I said, who knows what's gonna happen in 2016? That was probably my greatest understatement ever. Um, and I said, if Justice Ginsburg wants somebody with her values and her views to take her place, she'd re she retire this summer. I didn't think she would pay any attention to that. Well, she gave many interviews where she said, some such as Erwin Chemerinsky think I should retire. I'm not going anywhere. And she had some mutual acquaintances let me know. She was really displeased with my saying that. Um, but when I saw her in October, which is the last time that I saw her, she didn't say a word about it. Well, and you know, from whatever heavenly perch she's in right now, she might be reconsidering, but it's it's too late. I guess, you know, I kind of feel like on a lot of uh, interview shows, they they end with some um, sort of clever little, you know, uh, you know, what's your favorite food and and you know, all of that. But but I just would be interested. Um, looking back, I, I really don't know anything about your personal life other than that you grew up on the south side of Chicago and, and you know, a few factoids, but was there somebody in your life, in your family, was there something that occurred um, or an experience you had that influenced your desire to go into the law and particularly influenced your interest in the Constitution? Indirectly, yes. Directly, no. 
Um, you know, probably the person who had the biggest effect on me was my dad, um, and certainly my mom as well. But you know, my dad, neither of my parents went to college. My dad worked in a home improvement store, like, I don't know, Builders Emporium, Lowe's, we call it. It was called Courtesy Home Center on the south side of Chicago. My mom always worked in the home. Um, so it wasn't that either of them were, I didn't know a lawyer until I went to law school. The first lawyer I ever met was whoever my first law professor was who was a lawyer. But my dad had a strong commitment to justice. I mean, just in the, the way he dealt with people, um, the, 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 the views that he expressed. And, and I have no doubt that, that those values and very Jewish values had an effect on me. Um, I went to law school because I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Uh, if you had talked to me at any point in college, I would have told you I wanted to be a high school teacher. I took all the classes in college to become a certified high school teacher. I did my student teaching. I became a certified high school social studies teacher, but then said, I really want to go be a civil rights lawyer. And that's what caused me to go to law school. So I can't directly tie that to my parents, but I can sure indirectly tie it to them and especially my dad's values and views. Well, this has been an incredible, slightly more than an hour. This, this by Jewish standards, we stopped right <laughs> on time. And um, I just wanna thank you, um, Erwin, so much for this incredibly um, powerful um, opportunity to, to really get insight and, and clarity around a lot of issues that we are um, wrestling with right now because of the times that we're living in. Um, a friend who's on this sent me a text and said, now I'm totally depressed. And I said, well, you know, at least, at least we should know at least we should know what what what's real, and you know, uh, in this in these times of you know sort of a war on on facts and truth, and you know a, a lot of statements being made as fact that are not fact, and 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 all of this. I think you have given us um, a mini crash course that is going to be helpful in us both assessing. Uh, what happens with the election and beyond, um, but also understanding the importance of our own role as voters in the process. And I think sometimes we think there's somebody out there who is going to handle everything. And I think we, we have allowed democracy to go on autopilot. And I think we're realizing that we have to reclaim that power of we the people in our democracy. And, and, and I think that that message came through in your remarks as well. So on behalf of the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County, thank you so much for making the time uh, to be with us today. I do wanna also, this is uh, our very first uh, official donor recognition event. And I wanna thank the donors who are our audience today and, and many were unable to come and we'll make sure they get to see this. But um, I wanna thank everyone who has contributed to the success of the Jewish Collaborative. We need community now more than we really you know, ever, ever have. And so being connected through our Jewish community, through our broader networks, um, our networks of friends is gonna be very, very important to ensuring that our spirits remain strong and our perspective optimistic, regardless of what happens. So again, thank you, Erwin. This has been extraordinary. Thank you everybody who made the time to be here today, um, including my mom who's watching and possibly some of my children. So, um, so thank you so much. We, we greatly thank appreciate you, it. And if there's ever anything the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County can do for you, Erwin, we're here for you. You're so kind. Thank you for having me. And it's always such an incredible pleasure to see you and do programs with you. Thank you so much. And I see Rabbi Marsha is there waving. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rabbi, for all you do for the Jewish Collaborative. And uh, I think we've, we've had another wonderful program under the, under the Jewish Collaborative tent. So with that, everybody have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Dean Chemerinsky. Thank, thank you, Jackie. You. Wonderful.